Welcome to Chapter 7, Auditing, Testing, and Monitoring. We're going to explain the importance of security audits, uh, testing, and monitoring within an IT infrastructure. And some key concepts is just you know, the practices and principles of security audits, you know, ways to monitor our systems, capturing and analyzing log data, accessing an organization's security compliance, and monitoring and testing security systems. So a security audit is a crucial type of evaluation um, and it's not only to, to avoid data breaches uh, but just overall protect uh, your organization. Um, you know, auditing a computer system involves checking to see how its operation has met security goals as also as well as procedures and um, roles of uh, people uh, for, for uh, enacting and, and checking and making sure that everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing as well as the systems itself are set up and, and uh, configured as they should be. Um, and audit testing, uh, tests can be manual or automated. Uh, so it could be a, an auditor actually manually uh, performing the test or uh, kicking off or running scripts or, or using utilities and tools um, to do some testing. And, but before you can determine whether something has worked, you first must define how it's supposed to work. Right? This is known as assessing a system. So, one of the things we have to first ask are, are security policies sound and appropriate for the business or activity? Right? The purpose of information security is to support the mission of the business and to protect it from the risk it faces. With respect to security, one of the most visible risks is that of a data breach. Your organization's policies and supporting documents define the risk and the risks that affect the business and organization. But then supporting documents include, include your organization's procedures, standards, and baselines. When you conduct an audit, you're asking the question, are your policies understood and followed? The audit itself does not set new policies. Auditors might, however, make recommendations based on experience or knowledge of new regulations or other requirements or, and what they find. Um, but the actual purpose of the audit is to just figure out how well you're in compliance of your current policies and how are they understood and how are they followed. And then, you know, are the are the controls supporting your policies? So you have your policies, but do you have security controls that align correctly with the organization's strategies and missions? Do the controls support your policies and culture? If you can't justify a control by a policy, you should probably remove the control. Whenever a control is explained as for security, but with no other explanation, it should be removed. Right? Security is not a profit center. It should never exist for its own sake. It is in support of a department or a purpose or preventing a risk. Right? Its purpose is to protect the organization's assets and revenue streams. So is there effective implementations and upkeep of the controls? Right? As your organization evolves and threats mature, it's important to make sure your controls still meet the risk you face today. So are they still effective? Are, are we implementing them correctly? And are we um, sunsetting and getting rid of controls that no longer matter? Uh, the r risks have changed, right? So this brings us to the security life cycle. Right? We, we monitor and review uh, the, the measure all controls to capture actions and changes on the system. Then we audit and review the logs and overall environment to provide independent analysis of how well the security policies and the controls are working. Then we improve, you know, and we, which includes proposals to improve the security program, the controls, and the audit results. This step applies to the recommended changes as accepted by management. And secure, we ensure that the new and existing controls work together to protect 
the intended level of security and then we go back to monitoring again. So what is acceptable, right? Well, we need to define acceptable and unacceptable actions. We need to create standards based on those developed or endorsed by the standard bodies. Uh, communications and other actions permitted by a policy document that are acceptable and communications and other actions specifically banned in our security policy as unacceptable. We have uh, several, I guess, areas or types of security audits. You have large in scope and cover the entire departments or business functions, or they may be narrow in scope and address only one specific system or control. Um, you can have both types of audits, um, and, and it really depends on what the goal of the audit is, uh, depending on, you know, um, like in the larger scope audits, you, you might be looking just at compliance of high level uh, uh, policies, uh, etc. Uh, whereas in a narrow focus, you, you might really be looking at every actual control and doing real technical dives um, into a system to ensure its compliance. So several types of uh, purposes of our audits, you know, the appropriateness of the controls, right? Is the level of security control suitable for the risk it is addressing? Uh, correct installation of the control. Have, have we configured it in the right place and is it working well? Is it do, doing what it's intended to do? And then the purpose of controls is the security control effective in addressing the risk it was designed to address. Service organization control or SOC reports. Um, you have different le levels of reporting, SOC 1, SOC 2, SOC 3. Uh, SOC 1 is the internal controls over financial reporting, uh, audiences, users, and auditors, and organizations that must comply with SOCs or the GLB, Graham Leach Bly Act. Um, this is where the SOC 1 uh, comes into play. SOC 2, uh, security, confidentiality, integrity, availability, and privacy controls. Right, audiences, the management, regulators, stakeholders, uh, service providers, hosted data centers, managed cloud providers. And the, the, these are the ones that are concerned with SOC 2 compliance. Uh, SOC 3 uh, is also security, confidentiality, integrity, availability, and privacy controls. But it's uh, a public, you know, your audience is the public and customers of SOC 2 service providers. Right. Defining your audit plan. So in your plan, you're going to define the objectives, uh, determine which systems or business or processes you're going to audit and review, um, define which areas of assurance to check, and then identify personnel who will participate in the audit. And this forms your audit plan. That's a very uh, organized uh, plan and well-defined before an audit starts. And then to define the scope of the plan, right? You might do a survey of the sites and I will want to understand the environment and the interconnections connections between systems before starting the audit activities, right? You, you need to survey the, the land, right? You need to survey the site and, and kind of get an idea of what, what's all involved, what, what systems are interacting with other systems and what might be privy within the scope. Uh, review documentation, right? An auditor will want to review systems documentations, the configurations, uh, both during the planning and as part of the actual audit. Um, reviewing interoperability agreements, requirements is necessary when the audits include external partners. These documents specify, specify agreed upon compliance requirements for outsourcing partners, right? Are we able to audit uh, the uh, third party vendor or, or data center? Um, that, that will be part of those do that documentation and you'll want to figure that out before you define the scope of your audit. Uh, 
review risk analysis output. Uh, an auditor will want to understand system criticality ratings that are a product of the risk analysis studies. This helps rank systems in the appropriate order for mitigation in the reporting phase, right? So, you know, what, what's the most important? What, what, what's critical to get out of this audit? Uh, review server and application logs. An auditor might ask to examine logs to look for changes to programs, permissions, or configurations. Um, review incident logs. An auditor might ask to review the security incident logs to get a feel for problems and trends. Uh, review uh, results of penetration tests. Um, when an organization conducts penetration testing, the tester prepares a report listing weaknesses that are found. The auditor needs to review this report and make sure that the audit addresses all the items that were found in the vulnerability re assessment report or penetration uh, test. So the audit scope um, deals with the seven domains of the IT infrastructure. Right? You, know, you have remote access, um, wide area networks, uh, the local area network to the wide area network, uh, workstations and users, the actual local area network, uh, intranet services, internal services um, to the organization, um, systems, and major applications. Auditing benchmarks and uh, the standard to which your system is compared to determine whether it is securely configured. We use many uh, organizations to help with this. Um, ISO 2702, uh, NIST uh, is, uh, from the federal government is a very uh, well known um, use of uh, uh, security standards and, and guidance. Uh, ITIL um, is the uh, service management processes and procedures, you know, how you do your change management, how you do your problem management, incident management. They have some good information and concepts and policies for managing an IT infrastructure. Um, then you got COBIT, and uh, it's also uh, much like NIST, it has a lot of good. Uh, best practices for IT management and it was created uh, by the Information Systems Audit uh, the control uh, uh, the Information Systems Audit the Control Association or ISACA um, and it gives managers, auditors, and IT users a set of generally accepted measures, indicators, processes, and best practices. Um, you can use COBIT to help obtain the most benefit from the use of information technology and to develop appropriate IT governance and control in a company. And then you've got COSO um, from the Institute of Internal Auditors and um, it, this is a volunteer run organization giving guidance to executive management and governance entities on critical aspects of organizational governments and business ethics, internal controls, uh, risk management, fraud, and financial reporting. Audit data collection methods. There's various ways auditors go about collecting uh, information to perform their audit. Um, many, many of which start with uh, questionnaires. Um, you can administer and prepare questionnaires to both managers and users. Um, then you actually might hold interviews um, after you've collected some information and questionnaires uh, you'll probably do some interviews and they're useful for gathering insights into the operations from all parties. Interviews often provide to be valuable sources of information and recommendations. Uh, you, you, you can get a better feel of how, how things are done and, and what's going on in a, in a, in a uh, area uh, through an interview but I would say that you want to get your questionnaires done first to get just some basic information so that you can have some place to start with in your interviews. Um, observations, uh, these refer to input used to uh, differentiate between paper procedures and the way the job is really done. So actually, you know, so shoulder surf or remote 
wrote desktop and watch somebody do and perform a task uh, uh, is very valuable. Um, checklists, these are prepared documents to help ensure that the information gathering process covers all areas. Uh, reviewing documentation, uh, this documentation assesses currency, adherence, and completeness. Uh, reviewing configurations, um, this review involves assessing change control procedures and the appropriateness of controls, rules, and lay layouts. Uh, reviewing policies, this review involves assessing the policy relevance, currency, and completeness over the area and the controls. And performing security testing, uh, vulnerability testing, and penetration testing might be involved um, in, in gathering technical information to determine whether vulnerabilities exist in the security components, networks, or applications. And areas to include in an audit plan, you know, antivirus, uh, system access policies, intrusion detection and event monitoring, uh, system hardening policies, uh, cryptographic controls, and contingency planning. Um, and so then you have the various goals for each one of those areas. Um, but it's just basically to, to learn about your controls and what's in place to help safeguard your and prevent uh, mitigate your risks. Um, some other areas include hardware and software maintenance, physical security, access controls, uh, change control processes for configuration management, right? How do changes get get uh, performed or not uh, performed accurately and uh, safely? Uh, media protection, Control checks and identity management, right? So, um, who who approves the controls or ident you know uh, uh, grants approval for access, right? Who reviews this? It, you know, who, who is the uh, access reviewed on a periodic basis? Um, authentication mechanisms. What what mechanisms are used to specify security requ requirements? Pass, password policies and enforcement. Does the organization have an effective password policy and is it uniformly enforced? Uh, monitoring. Does the organization have sufficient monitoring systems to detect unauthorized access? Remote access. Uh, are all systems properly secured with strong authentication? And these are just basics, um, but you, you have to do these um, time and time again in audits um, of, of areas that you know just just the a lot of the basics um, need to need to be verified and validated that they they are existing and being in compliance post audit activities right you'll have exit interviews um, basically the auditor is going to run through with the area and give them a heads up or explain it back to them what they feel that they've seen and is this accurate right um, and, and it gives the the last chance for that area to maybe make a correction or, or a statement about uh, some compliance um, that w may have been misinterpreted or mi misunderstood in, in earlier um, but mostly it, it's just for an awareness of what what the auditors learn. Um, data analysis, right? so now we've gathered all this information, we're gonna go through it and, and actually um, figure out what's in compliance, what's not in compliance. So uh, then we're gonna generate our findings. Um, what, what is, you know, what was wrong? What's out of compliance? What, what should be fixed? Um, we'll possibly give some recommendations right so maybe you should be using SSL you know or, uh, TL, TLS and um, instead of not in, you know having things in clear text you know so you might might give some recommendations um, and then a timeline for implementation uh, how, you know when are you going to be coming back and expecting it to be fixed uh, the level of risk right so maybe maybe it's a low risk uh, or maybe it's a high critical risk um, uh, yeah, a management response so then uh, then 
from leadership and management, you know, what, what, what is the response to the findings and recommendations? How are they going to handle it? Are they, you know, are they, are they, are they going to follow up on it? Um, and then following up, you know, the auditors, uh, someone needs to go back and check what the area and the area has to also do report ins um, on the findings and uh, especially the mediums and highs, criticals, things like those definitely get followed up. The lows will as well, but um, it's not as critical um, as the mediums and highs you know, and above. Uh, and then, then there will be a presentation of the audit findings with uh, leadership and, and the area's management um, so that everybody is understanding what was found and what's required. So in the, in the security life cycle, we said that we, um, we had monitoring as the first uh, section. You, you got baselines, right? In order to recognize something as abnormal, you first must know what normal looks like. So you have to set and have some baselines. Um, then you can set alarms and alerts, um, you know, that are re that can go off in response to security events that notify personnel of a possible security incident, much like a door open alert or a fire alarm. Um, be aware that employees will quickly ignore repeated false alarms. For this reason, storing alerts and alarms makes it possible to show how events occur over time. This type of analysis helps identify trends, and trends analysis helps auditors focus on more than just individual events. Um, but yeah, be, be aware that if you have alerts going off all the time, uh, if you're always yelling fire, uh, people are just going to ignore the fire. <laughs> so, um, but if you store them and, and review them and, and go over them, um, you hold them accountable still, uh, th that makes more sense too. Uh, closed circuit TV, um, that's a way of monitoring, right? Properly using a closed circuit TV involves monitoring and recording what the TV cameras see. You must ensure that security officers monitoring the cameras are trained to watch for certain actions or behavior. And your staff must also be trained in local law. Many jurisdictions prohibit uh, profiling based on race or necessity. Um, so you need to be properly trained on how to, to deal with uh, handling a video. Systems that spotlight, spot irregular behavior Right. So examples could include an uh, intrusion detection system, an IDS, or honeypots. Uh, you know that is you know traps set to capture information about improper activity on a network. Um, but you'll have some of those systems as well. Uh, and then for computer systems, you can have some uh, real-time monitoring. Uh, some some examples are the host uh, IDS or intrusion detection systems you know so they actually sit on the computer or host and they're excellent for noticing activity in a computer as the activity is happening and IDS rules help identify suspicious activity in near real time um, system integrity monitoring is also another real-time monitoring systems such as tripwire enable you to watch computer systems for unauthorized changes and report them to administrators in near real time and then data loss prevention is another real-time monitoring and dlp uh, systems uh, use business roles to classify sensitive information or data and prevent unauthorized users uh, from sharing it and data that DLP protects are generally data that could be that could put an organization at risk if they were disclosed so for example a DLP system might prevent users from using external storage devices so, uh, services such as Dropbox or, or uh, uh, iCloud or, or something like that right um, Google OneDrive uh, and uh, so data loss prevention is a, is a big step, but you have to classify your data in order to uh, have that working effectively. Then you can have some non-real-time monitoring, uh, application logging, system logging, uh, and then just 
uh, log logging these activities, right? Um, you can have uh, host based activity it includes changes to systems, access requests, performance startups, shutdowns, and then network and network devices. And these include access, traffic type patterns, malware, and performance. And then types of log information to capture. You have event logs, uh, you know, you know uh, general operating system a application software events, uh, access logs, uh, requests to resources, security logs, any security related events, and then audit logs to find events that provide additional input to audit activities or any changes that were done, um, things like that. Um, can can be logged and most of your devices and especially in large uh, environments will send all their information to a logging server or servers um, and so you have this you know centralized uh, location for your logs uh, you know your firewalls router switches your network intrusion detection systems your web you know, servers, all those, um, will send the log to these logging hosts um, and then be centralized, ma centrally managed so that you can search and index them. Uh, how to verify security controls, right? So controls that monitor activity, right? Your intrusion detection systems, even your intrusion prevention systems, your firewalls, these are good controls uh, on your network. Um, that help monitor and and prevent certain traffic too, um, and so intrusion detection systems are a good complement uh, to a firewall because uh, they're they, you know they can use m more sophisticated algorithms on the traffic, uh, whereas the firewall, uh, a basic firewall, is really more limited at the network layer. Uh, layer three and maybe even a little bit of layer four or and layer two um, to some degree um, based on IP ports things like that um, that's your basic firewall um, and then your intrusion detection system is looking at actually at the the uh, payloads within the packets and that and what was it doing what is it what is it wanting to do what could it do um, so it's a good complement and your basic network intrusion detection system as a co complement to the firewall right sits there right on on the network uh, before um, it comes into uh, the local uh, LAN area or the internal network right so it's a network device um, so then we have some analysis methods that the IDS will have. You can have a pattern or signature based. Um, they just have these defined patterns and signatures for attacks and so they recognize them when they see them. Um, you have anomaly based IDS. They, they profile uh, the base systems and then look for something that's out, that out of uh, not normal. And then common methods of detecting anomalies is just, you know, using statistical base methods, uh, traffic-based methods, protocol patterns, uh, and then uh, host uh, IDS or host intrusion detection systems. You know, it's designed to sit and run on the server or computers. Uh, it, intercepts and examines system calls for specific processes for patterns or behaviors that aren't normal um, and they can uh, uh, take predefined actions such as stopping or reporting the infraction and detect inappropriate traffic that originates inside the network and recognize an anomaly that is specific to a particular machine or user. So it's machine specific or user specific uh, versus the network intrusion detection system. And so here, um, you know, the layered defense, right? So you have the untrusted network or internet on the right. The traffic comes in through your router, uh, goes to your firewall, and then goes to your trusted network after your firewall, probably between your firewall. Uh, and the trusted network would be a network intrusion detection system. 
or prevention system or both. Um, so here, right, so they show the network intrusion detection system and then you even have your host over on the trusted network and the host has its own uh, IDS process as well. And host isolation and the DMZ, the demilitarized zone, uh, is where your web servers and email servers will tend to reside and they'll have host uh, uh, intrusion detection systems on them. Um, and they live off the firewall. Technically, um, I don't like this depiction of a DMZ. It is a bare minimum, um, but typically you'll have uh, two firewalls in, in most most uh, network settings. Um, you'll have the uh, firewall um, at the internet side, um, and that will go. Uh, it'll have a. a uh, um, segment off to the DMZ and then um, it'll have another segment that goes to the internal firewall and that sets in front of your trusted network and so um, if the web server and email server need to talk to anything in the trusted network they have to go through the internal firewall um, but 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 it has to come from those servers um, Otherwise, no, nothing goes through um, the internal firewall. Um, so I, I don't like this with just a single firewall, but I mean, it, it can be done. Uh, but typically, I, I see and, and prefer to have two firewalls, one at the internet side and then one at the trusted network side with the uh, web server and email server being in between the two firewalls. system hardening uh, basically you're turning off all unnecessary services you know the you know, uninstalling any software or any any configuration that is unnecessary on the server you you, you disable it uh, remove it um, you secure uh, lock it down as as much as possible uh, protect passwords through aggressive password policies requiring changes and complex passwords uh, disable any unnecessary user accounts, apply the latest software patches, secure all computers devices from unauthorized changes, disabled unused network interfaces, unused application service ports, uh, maybe even use Mac filtering to limit device access, you know, what devices can communicate to it, and implement uh, 802.1.x.1x.1x .1x, and then uh, P PNAC as well. Uh, monitoring and testing security systems. There are common risks that attackers who come in from the outside with unauthorized access, malicious code, Trojans, malware. Um, most of our uh, tool set, you know, and if you configure the network right, it does a very adequate job of, of preventing this type of, of risk. Um, and then system information leaking from the inside the organization by unauthorized people who can damage your organization this is a little harder um, to put things into place for and prevent um, you know the attacks from the inside or um, even people um, being um, uh, coerced uh, into doing things uh, as well so people inside can be your weakest link um, on a network and then once again monitoring traffic with with an IDS intrusion detection system you know it identifies abnormal traffic for further investigation whereas an IPS or intrusion prevention system will identify the abnormal traffic but it can also block it it, it actually takes action so that's the difference between the IDS and the IPS testing right so we you know you test you know what what is it before or after right um, and then you know you you got your before and after sh uh, shot uh, uh, test you know um, here you have a vulnerable service that's added to the host you have unnecessary service um, it needs to be removed right and then you, you found uh, you you found that you know it's an unpatched service um, that shouldn't even be there um, so 
in that case you would want to disable the service or patch it for sure um, but it, well, most likely you want to disable it um, but here's just the testing road roadmap you do some reconnaissance learn what you can about the system uh, it involves reviewing the system to learn as much as possible about the, the organizations and systems and networks how it's used uh, the jobs you know, who is it um, and, and what what might be invisible to the network administrators and and then when they are used by attackers instead of penetration testers right so you know um, just figuring out everything you can about the system uh, network mapping uh, this phase uses tools to determine the layout and services running on the organization systems and networks um, then you could do some vulnerability testing you know, once you once you've done your reconnaissance and know what's what's available what it is how it does its work and then how the networks lay out then you can do some vulnerability testing and trying to find any of the weaknesses in the systems and defer, determine which places may be attack points right uh, that's vulnerability testing then penetration testing in this phase you try to exploit any of the weaknesses you found in the vulnerability testing and prove that an attacker could successfully penetrate it and then of course you have some mitigation activities and how can you reduce or address the vulnerabilities found in either the penetration testing or vulnerability testing establishing testing goals and reconnaissance methods right so you, you need to establish testing goals you identify the vulnerabilities and rank them according to how critical they are to your systems document a point in time snapshot test for comparisons to other time periods uh, prepare for the audit review uh, find gaps in your security uh, these are some of your goals and you need to have it especially if you're going to do any penetration testing you really need to know uh, what you're doing what your goals are and have approval written approval um, before you do any penetration testing you, you need it well documented what you're doing and why um, because without it you can get into serious trouble even if you are trying to help the organization uh, reconnaissance methods you know social engineering you know uh, who is uh, zone transfers uh, you, you, you can gather information in all kinds of different ways uh, of course social engineering is probably our biggest weakest link people people are the weakest link in, in a network for sure network mapping so here just showing you know using a tool on the laptop we're just probing the network and figuring out what devices are out there and finding out if we can figure out you know what services are running on that device and what OS that device is um, these are all big issues uh, you really don't want your systems giving up that information um, but you, you know as much as possible anyway um, but that's the gathering of the network mapping is what you're trying to do is trying to figure out what's on your network and then you could use ICM ping a lot of organizations disable ping and a lot of devices by default disable ping um, but you can uh, figure out uh, quite a bit uh, if it's enabled um, you can you can figure out a lot about your network just with ICMP echo requests um, then you do network mapping with TCP SYN uh, requests right so network mapping um, uh, TCP has a three uh, three part handshake um, it sends a SYN and then a SYNAC and then an ACK um, so you can do this on each of the various ports so like this one is showing uh, network mapping on port 23 um, it sends sends a SYN on TCP port 23 uh, the target sends back a SYN ACK and then you send an ACK and then you you conclude that telnet services is available on that device um, then uh, if you get a, uh, a reset though uh, then you know that uh, telnet is not available on that host uh, but then you can also map uh, with the half open sin right 
so you're you're just wanting to get that synac right so if you you know you, you don't have to do the full three three part handshake um, and you can just do the sin on say on port 143 then they send the synac and then you send a reset but you, you still know that the target uh, has IMAP email on it um, whereas then below it, it's just the same thing if the target doesn't have IMAP it's going to send the reset um, so uh, operating system fingerprinting so you you may uh, figure out what operating system is based on responses on some of these ports and scans that you do um, and you, you know uh, and so that that's all it is you there's a lot of fingerprinting and, and knowledge um, that you can determine the actual version of of software or what you know is it running Windows Server 2003 2008 or is it Linux right does you know does it have the uh, Windows IIS or the internet server turned on to it based on its HTTP banner you know there's certain ways that you can you can identify what type of OS a machine is you try to hide this as much as you can um, in your configurations and settings um, but it is still sometimes possible Testing methods. So black box testing uh, uses test methods that aren't based directly on knowledge of the program's architecture or design. So you're basically in the dark, right? You just, you, 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 the, the tester does not have the source code or details of the source code or any relevance of what is being tested. But another way, the black box testing focus on the externally visible behavior of the software May based on requirements, protocol specification, APIs, or attempted attacks. White box testing is based on knowledge of the application design and source code. In fact, white box tests are generally derived from the source code. Uh, for example, these tests might target specific constructs found in the source code to try to achieve a certain level of code coverage. So we, we know almost everything there is to know about the, the application or device. Um, in white box testing and then gray box testing is somewhere in between you might have some knowledge but it's limited of uh, the programming's internals um, you, know, you might know some parts of the source code but not others in practice it usually just means the tester has access to design documents that are more detailed than spe than specifications requirements and the test might be based on an architecture diagram or a stated base model of the program's behavior. So you have some knowledge, but it's limited. Covert versus overt testing. So covert testing, right? So um, you're a hostile attacker role. You test without warning. You have little guidance uh, from the staff. And you, you might surprise people, and you know they don't know it's coming. Uh, uh, and then overt testing is everybody knows you got full staff cooperation. It's planned test times. You have diagrams and information, and everybody knows about it and knows it's coming. And security testing tips and techniques. Right? Choose the right tool. Choosing the tools that are best for testing your software depends on what is to be tested and how the test plan indicates the test should be carried out. Keep in mind the tool functions over often overlap and so it, it may you may choose certain different tools um, for very similar tests um, but you know, just a, a slight variation. So you, choosing the right tool is very important. And tools do make mistakes. You should uh, view preliminary results with skepticism. Watch for false positives or false negatives. So tools results can be ver can vary because uh, detection methods often are not consistent. You know, did you really use the right settings both times? You know, uh, there there's all kinds of reasons why you might also get false positive false negatives and so you know take testing results from a tool uh, with a grain of salt you know trust but verify uh, protect your systems uh, carry out tests at the wrong time or in the wrong way can damage systems or bring down networks right so take care to protect your systems 
Um, you, you could destroy data. Uh, you, there's all kinds of things that you can do unintentionally. Um, so be very, very careful. Uh, um, and be sure that you're protecting your systems at all costs. Um, and tests should be as real as possible. So tests should run against production networks and systems to the degree that is possible without impairing system operations, right? Um, yeah, but there's certain things that you just can't do um, in, in a real world environment. So, um, you know, if you if you have something that you know like a, a financial system um, that you're trying to audit and you, you can't simulate fake transactions through through the system because they get logged and they they would show up in your financial reports you know that you might be uh, submitting to the government or or some uh, other regulation body and uh, so you, you really can't send through fake transactions in the production environment. Um, so you know you, you can only follow real transactions that you know have, are being on there. So there's just certain things you can't do. Um, but you know, um, but following a real real uh, uh, transaction is something you could do um, to some degree, depending on uh, the level of security and access and confidentiality and privacy laws and things like that too so there there's there's certain things that may or may not be possible um, but you do try to do as much real as possible whenever possible and that is our chapter seven on auditing uh, I will see you in chapter eight